Good evening and thank you for choosing this video. I am glad you are here watching. Today is the start of hopefully an interesting new arc on this channel. Uh, previously we've been diving into topics of mysticism, magic, the hermetic tradition, critical thinking, conspiracy theories, epistemology, occultism, um, as I generally just try to figure out all the secrets of the universe. So we're working our way through it. Today we're going to read and analyze an essay called The Stages of Life by famous Swiss psychologist Carl Jung. Uh, he was born in 1875 and died in 1961. Uh, if you already know this essay or get the gist of it part way through, like, yeah, I got that, all right, let's move it on, you could skip ahead to my analysis following the timestamp below. And in case you're wondering, the game in the background is called Arden Fall. It's an indie game you can find on Steam. A-R-D-E-I-N Fall. If you are new here, welcome to the channel. My name is Michael Kuhlman. I hope you enjoy listening as much as I enjoy learning about these crazy topics. Leave your comment below and tell me what you liked or what you hated as I'm actively looking for engagement on this channel. Thank you and now let's get to the essay by Carl Jung. The Stages of Life by Carl Jung To discuss the problems connected with the stages of human development is an extracting task for it means nothing less than unfolding a picture of psychic life in its entirety from the cradle to the grave. Within the framework of a lecture, such a task can be carried out only on the broadest lines, and it must be well understood that no attempt will be made to describe the normal psychic occurrences within the various stages. We shall restrict ourselves, rather, to certain problems, that is, to things that are difficult questionable or ambiguous, in a word, to questions which allow of more than one answer, and moreover, answers that are always open to doubt. For this reason, there will be much to which we must add a question mark in our thoughts. Worse still, there will be some things we must accept on faith, while now and then we must even indulge in speculations. If psychic life consisted only of self-evident matters of fact, which on a primitive level is still the case, we could content ourselves with a, st with a sturdy empiricism. The psychic life of civilized man, however, is full of problems. We cannot even think of it except in terms of problems. Our psychic processes are made up to a large extent of reflections, doubts, experiments, all of which are almost completely foreign to the unconscious, instinctive mind of primitive man. It is the growth of consciousness which we must thank for the existence of problems. They are the Danaean gift of civilization. It is just man's turning away from instinct, his opposing himself to instinct, that creates consciousness. Instinct is nature and seeks to perpetuate nature, whereas consciousness can only seek culture or its denial. Even when we turn back to nature, inspired by a Rousseau-esque longing, we cultivate nature. As long as we are still submerged in nature, we are unconscious, and we live in the security of instinct, which knows no problems. Everything in us that still belongs to nature shrinks away from a problem, for its name is doubt, and Wherever doubt holds sway, there is uncertainty and the possibility of divergent ways. And where several ways seem possible, there we have turned away from the certain guidance of instinct and are handed over to fear. For consciousness is now called upon to do what nature has always done for her children, namely, to give a certain unquestionable and unequivocal decision. And here we are beset by an all-too-human fear that consciousness, our Promethean conquest, may in the end not be able to serve us as well as nature. Problems thus draw us into an orphaned and isolated state where we are abandoned by nature and are driven to consciousness. There is no other way open to us. We are forced to resort to conscious decisions and solutions where formerly we trusted ourselves to natural happenings. Every problem, therefore, 
brings the possibility of a widening of consciousness, but also the necessity of saying goodbye to childlike unconsciousness and trust in nature. This necessity is a psychic feat of such importance that it constitutes one of the most essential symbolic teachings of the Christian religion. It is the sacrifice of the merely natural man, of the unconscious, ingenious being whose tragic career began with the eating of the apple in paradise. The biblical fall of man pre presents the dawn of consciousness as a curse. And as a matter of fact, it is in this light that we first look upon every problem that forces us to greater consciousness and separates us even farther from the paradise of unconscious childhood. Every one of us gladly turns away from his problems. If possible, they must not be mentioned, or better still, their existence is denied. We wish to make our lives simple, certain, and smooth, and for that reason, problems are taboo. We want to have certainties and no doubts, results and no experiments, without even seeing that certainties can arise only through doubt and results only through experiment. The artful denial of a problem will not produce conviction. On the contrary, a wider and higher consciousness is required to give us the certainty and clarity we need. This introduction, long as it is, seemed to me necessary in order to make clear the nature of our subject. When we must deal with problems, we instinctively resist trying the way that leads through obscurity and darkness. We wish to hear only of unequivocal results and completely forget that these results can only be brought about when we have ventured into and emerged again from the darkness. But to penetrate the darkness, we must summon all the powers of enlightenment that consciousness can offer. As I have already said, we must even indulge in speculations. For in treating the problems of psychic life, we perpetually stumble upon questions of principle belonging to the private domains of the most heterogeneous branches of knowledge. We disturb and anger the theologian no less than the philosopher, the physician no less than the educator. We even grope about in the field of the biologist and of the historian. This extravagant behavior is due not to arrogance, but to the circumstance that man's psyche is a unique combination of factors which are at the same time the special subjects of far-reaching lines of research. For it is out of himself and out of his peculiar constitution that man has produced his sciences. They are symptoms of his psyche. If, therefore, we ask ourselves the unavoidable question, why does man, in obvious contrast to the animal world, have problems at all? We run into that inextricable tangle of thoughts which many thousands of incisive minds have woven in the course of centuries. I shall not perform the labors of a Sisyphus upon this masterpiece of confusion, but will try to present quite simply my contribution towards man's attempt to answer these basic, this basic question. There are no problems without consciousness. We must therefore put the question in another way and ask, how does consciousness arise in the first place? Nobody can say with certainty, but we can observe small children in the process of becoming conscious. Every parent can see it if he pays attention. And what we see is this, when the child recognizes someone or something, when he knows a person or a thing, when we feel that the child has consciousness. That, no doubt, is why in paradise it is the tree of knowledge which bore such fateful fruit. But what is recognition of knowledge in this sense? We speak of knowing something when we succeed in linking a new perception to an already existing context in such a way that we hold in consciousness not only the perception but parts of this context as well. Knowing is based, therefore, upon the perceived connection between psychic contents. We can have no knowledge of a content that is not connected with anything, and we cannot even be conscious of it should our consciousness still be on this low initial level. Accordingly, the first stage of consciousness, which we can observe, consists in the mere connection between two or more psychic contents. At this level, consciousness is merely sporadic. 
being limited to the perception of a few connections, and the content is not remembered later on. It is a fact that in the early years of life, there is no continuous memory. At most, there are islands of consciousness, which are like single lamps or lighted objects in the far-flung distance. But these islands of memory are not the same as those earliest connections, which are merely perceived. They contain a new, very important series of contents belonging to the perceiving subject himself, the so-called ego. This series, like the initial series of contents, is at first merely perceived, for this reason, the child logically begins by speaking of itself objectively in the third person. Only later, when the ego contents, the so-called ego complex, have acquired an energy of their own, very likely as a result of training and practice, does the feeling of subjectivity or I-ness arise. This, this may well be the moment when the child begins to speak of itself in the first person. The continuity of memory probably begins at this stage. Essentially, therefore, it would be a continuity of ego memories. In the childish stage of consciousness, there are as yet no problems. Nothing depends upon the subject, for the child itself is still wholly dependent on its parents. It is as though it were not yet completely born, but were still enclosed in the psychic atmosphere of its parents. Psychic birth, and with it the conscious differentiation from the parents normally takes place only at puberty with the eruption of sexuality. The physiological change is attended by a psychic revolution for the various bodily manifestations give such an emphasis to the ego that it is often that it often asserts itself without stint or moderation. This is sometimes called the unbearable age. Until this period is reached the psychic life of the individual is governed largely by instinct, and few or no problems arise. Even when external limitations oppose his subjective impulses, these restraints do not put the individual at variance with himself. He submits to them, or circumvents them, remaining quite at one with himself. He does not yet know the state of inner tension induced by a problem. This state only arises when what was an external limitation becomes an inner one, when one impulse is opposed by another. In psychological language, we would say the problematic, problematical state, the inner division with oneself, arises when, side by side, with the series of ego contents, a second series of equal intensity comes into being. This second series, because of its energy value, has a functional significance equal to that of the ego complex. We might call it another, second ego, which can on, on occasion even wrest the leadership from the first. This produces the division with oneself, the state that betokens a problem. To recapitulate what we have said, the first stage of consciousness, consisting in merely recognizing or knowing, is an anarchic or chaotic state. The second, that of the developed ego complex, is monarchic or monistic. The third brings another step forward in consciousness and consists in an awareness of the divided or dualistic state. And here we come to our real theme, the problem of the stages of life. First of all, we must deal with the period of youth. It extends roughly from the years just after puberty to middle life, which itself begins between 35th and 40th year. I might well be asked why I begin with the second stage, as though there were no problems connected with childhood. The complex psychic life of the child is, of course, a problem of the first magnitude to parents, educators, and doctors. But when normal, the child has no real problems of his own. It is only the adult human being who can have doubts about himself and be at variance with himself. We are all familiar with the sources of the problems that arise in the period of youth. For most people, it is the demands of life which harshly put an end to the dream of childhood. If the individual is sufficiently well prepared, the transition to a profession or career can take place smoothly. But if he clings to illusions that are contrary to reality, then problems will surely arise. No one can take the step into life without making certain assumptions. And occasionally these assumptions are false, 
that is, they do not fit the conditions into which one is thrown. Often it is a question of exaggerated expectations, underestimation of difficulties, unjustified optimism, or a negative attitude. One could compile quite a list of the false assumptions that give rise to the first conscious problems. But it is not always the contradiction between subjective assumptions and external facts that gives rise to problems. It may just as often be inner psychic difficulties. They may even exist when things run smoothly in the outside world. Very often it is the disturbance of psychic equilibrium caused by the sexual instinct. Equally, often, it is the feeling of inferiority which springs from an unbearable sensitivity. These inner conflicts may er exist even when an adaptation to the outer world has been achieved without apparent effort. It even seems as if young people who have a hard struggle for existence are spared inner problems, while those for some reason or other have no difficulty with adaptation run into problems of sex or conflicts arising from a sense of inferiority. People whose own temperaments offer problems are often neurotic, but it would be a serious misunderstanding to confuse the existence of problems with neurosis. There is a marked difference between the two in that neurotic is ill because he is unconscious of his problems, while the person with a difficult temperament suffers from his conscious problems without being ill. If we try to extract the common and essential factors from the almost inexhaustible variety of individual problems found in the period of youth, we meet in all cases with one particular feature, a more or less patent clinging to the childhood level of consciousness, a resistance to the fateful forces in and around us which would involve us in the world. Something in us wishes to remain a child, to be unconscious or at most, conscious only of the ego. To reject everything strange, or else subject it to our will. To do nothing, or else indulge our own craving for pleasure or power. In all this, there is something of the inertia of the matter. It is a persistence in the previous state, whose range of consciousness is smaller, narrower, and more egotistic than that of the dualistic phase. For here the individual is faced with the necessity of recognizing and accepting what is different and strange as a part of his own life, as a kind of also I. The essential feature of the dualistic phase is the widening of the horizon of life, and it is this that is so vigorously resisted. To be sure, this expansion, or diastole, as Goethe called it, had started long before this. It begins at birth when the child abandons the narrow confinement of the mother's body, and from then on it steadily increases until it reaches a climax in the problematical state, when the individual begins to struggle against it. What would happen to him if he simply changed himself into that foreign-seeming also-I and allowed the earlier ego to vanish into the past? We might suppose this to be quite a practical course. The very aim of religious education from the ex exhortation to put off the old Adam right back to the rebirth rituals of primitive races, is to transform the human being into the new, future man, and to allow the old to die away. Psychology teaches us, in a certain sense, there is nothing in the psyche that is old, nothing that can really finally die away. Even Paul was left with a thorn in the flesh. Whoever protects himself against what is new and strange and regresses to the past falls into the same neurotic condition as the man who identifies himself with the new and runs away from the past. The only difference is that the one who has estranged himself from the past and the other from the future. In principle, both are doing the same thing. They are reinforcing their narrow range of consciousness instead of shattering it in the tension of opposites and building up a state of wider and higher consciousness. This outcome would be ideal if it could be brought about in the second stage of life, but there's the rub. For one thing, nature cares nothing whatsoever about a higher level of consciousness, quite the contrary. And then society does not value these feats of the psyche very highly. Its prizes are always given for achievement and not for personality, 
the latter being rewarded for the most part posthumously. These facts compel us towards a particular solution. We are forced to limit ourselves to the attainable and to differentiate particular aptitudes in which the socially effective individual discovers his true self. Achievement, usefulness, and so forth are the ideals that seem to point the way out of the confusions of the problematical state. They are the lodestars that guide us in the adventure of broadening and consolidating our physical existence. They help us to strike our roots in the world, but they cannot guide us in the development of that wider consciousness to which we give the name of culture. In the period of youth, however, this course is the normal one, and in all circumstances preferable to merely tossing about in a welter of problems. The dilemma is often solved, therefore, in this way. Whatever is given to us by the past is adapted to the possibilities and demands of the future. We limit ourselves to the attainable, and this means renouncing all our other psychic potentialities. One man loses a valuable piece of his past, another a valuable piece of his future. Everyone can call to mind friends or schoolmates who are promising and idealistic youngsters, but who, when we meet them again years later, seem to have grown dry and cramped in a narrow mold. These are examples of the solution mentioned above. The serious problems in life, however, are never fully solved. If ever they should appear to be so, it is a sure sign that something has been lost. The meaning and the purpose of a problem seem not to lie in its solution, but in our working at it incessantly. This alone preserves us from the stultification and petrification. So also the solution of the problems of youth by restricting ourselves to the attainable is only temporarily valid and not lasting in a deeper sense. Of course, to win for oneself a place in society and to transform one's nature so that it is more or less fitted to this kind of existence is, in all cases, a considerable achievement. It is a fight waged within oneself, as well as outside, comparable to the struggle of the child for an ego. That struggle is, for the most part, unobserved, because it happens in the dark. But when we see how stubbornly childish illusions and assumptions and egoistic habits are still clung to in later years, we can gain some idea of the energies that were needed to form them. And so it is with the ideals, convictions, guiding ideas, and attitudes which, in the period of youth, leads us out into life, for which we struggle, suffer, and win victories. They grow together with our own being. We apparently change into them. We seek to perpetuate them indefinitely, and as a matter of course, just as a young person asserts his ego in spite of the world and often in spite of himself. The nearer we approach to the middle of life, and the better we have succeeded in entrenching ourselves in our personal attitudes and social positions, the more it appears as if we had discovered the right course and the right ideals and principles of behavior. For this reason, we suppose them to be eternally valid and make a virtue of unchangeably clinging to them. We overlook the essential fact that the social goal is attained only at the cost of a diminution of personality. Many, far too many, aspects of life which should also have been experienced lie in the lumber room among dusty memories. But sometimes, too, they are glowing coals under gray ashes. Statistics show a rise in the frequency of mental depressions in men about 40. In women, the neurotic difficulties generally begin somewhat earlier. We see that in this phase of life, between 35 and 40, an important change in the human psyche is in preparation. At first, it is not a conscious and striking change. It is rather a matter of indirect signs of a change which seem to take its rise in the unconscious. Often it is something like a slow change in a person's character, and in another case certain traits may come to light which had disappeared since childhood, or again one's previous inclinations and interests may begin to weaken and others take their place. Conversely, and this happens very frequently, one's cherished convictions and principles, especially the moral ones, 
begin to harden and to grow increasingly rigid until somewhere around the age of 50, a period of intolerance and fanaticism is reached. It is as if the existence of these principles were endangered and it were therefore necessary to emphasize them all the more. The wine of youth does not always clear with advancing years. Sometimes it grows turbid. All the phenomena mentioned above can best be seen in rather one-sided people, turning up sometimes sooner and sometimes later. Their appearance, it seems to me, is often delayed by the fact that the parents of the person in question are still alive. It is then as if the period of youth were being unduly drawn out. I have seen this especially in the case of men whose fathers were long-lived. The death of the father then has the effect of a precipitate and almost catastrophic ripening. I know of a pious man who was a church warden and who, from the age of 40 onward, showed a growing and finally unbearable intolerance in matters of morality and religion. At the same time, his moods grew visibly worse. At last, he was nothing more than a darkly lowering pillar of the church. In this way, he got along until the age of 55, when suddenly, sitting up in bed in the middle of the night, he said to his wife, Now at last I've got it. I'm just a plain rascal. Nor did this realization remain without results. He spent his declining years in riotous living and squandered a goodly part of his fortune. Obviously quite a likable fellow, capable of both extremes. The very frequent neurotic disturbances of adult years all have one thing in common. They want to carry the psychology of the youthful phase over the threshold of the so-called years of discretion. Who does not know these touching old gentlemen who must always warm up the dish of their student days, who can fan the flame of life only by reminiscences of their heroic youth, but who for the rest are stuck in a hopelessly wooden philistinism? As a rule, to be sure, they have this one merit which it would be wrong to undervalue. They are not neurotic, but only boring and stereotyped. The neurotic is rather a person who can never have things as he would like them in the present, and who can therefore never enjoy the past either. As formerly the neurotic could not escape from childhood, so now he cannot part with his youth. He shrinks from the gray thoughts of approaching age and feeling the prospect before him unbearable. It is always straining to look behind him. Just as the childish person shrinks back from the unknown in the world and in human existence, so the grown man shrinks back from the second half of life. It is as if unknown and dangerous tasks awaited him, or as if he were threatened with sacrifices and losses, which he does not wish to accept. As if his life up to now seemed to him so fair and precious that he could not relinquish it. Is it perhaps at bottom the fear of death? That does not seem to me very probable, because as a rule, death is still far in the distance, and therefore somewhat abstract. Experience shows us, rather, that the basic cause of all the difficulties of this transition is to be found in a deep-seated and peculiar change within the psyche. In order to characterize it, I must take for comparison the daily course of the sun, but a sun that is endowed with human feeling and man's limited consciousness. In the morning it rises from the nocturnal sea of unconsciousness and looks upon the wide, bright world which lies before it in an expanse that steadily widens the higher it climbs in the firmament. In this extension of its field of action caused by its own rising, the sun will do soon discover its significance. It will see the attainment of the greatest possible height and the widest possible dissemination of its blessings as its goal. In this conviction, the sun pursues its course to the unforeseen zenith, unforeseen because its career is unique and individual, and the culminating point cannot be calculated in advance. At the stroke of noon, the descent begins and the descent means the reversal of all the ideals and values that were cherished in the morning. The sun falls into contradiction with itself. It is as though it should draw in its rays instead of emitting them. Light and warmth decline and are at last extinguished. All comparisons are lame, but this simile is at least not lamer than others. 
a French aphorism sums it up with cynical resignation. Se je ne sais, ça va y, se violesse, pouvez. Fortunately, we are not rising and setting suns, for then it would fare badly with our cultural values. But there is something sunlike within us, and to speak of the morning and spring, of the evening and autumn of life, is not mere sentimental jargon. We thus give expression for psychological truths, and even more to the psychological facts, for the reversal of the sun at noon changes even bodily characteristics. Especially among southern races, one can observe that older women develop deep, rough voices, incipient mustaches, rather hard features, and other masculine traits. On the other hand, the masculine physique is toned down by feminine features, such as adiposity and softer facial expressions. There is an interesting report in the ethnological literature about an Indian warrior chief to whom in middle life the great spirit appeared in a dream. The spirit announced to him that from then on he must sit among the women and children, wear women's clothes, and eat the food of women. He obeyed the dream without suffering a loss of prestige. This vision is a true expression of the psychic revolution of life's noon, of the beginning of life's decline. Man's values, and even his body, do tend to change into their opposites. We might compare masculinity and femininity, and their psychic components, to a definite store of substances of which, in the first half of life, unequal use is made. A man consumes his large supply of masculine substance, and has left over only the small amount of feminine substance, which now must be put to use. Conversely, the woman allows her hitherto unused supply of masculinity to become active. The change is even more noticeable in the psychic realm than in the physical. How often it happens that a man of 45 or 50 winds up his business, and the wife then dons the trousers and opens a little shop where he perf perhaps performs the duties of a handyman. There are many women who only awaken to social responsibility and to social consciousness after their 40th year. In modern business life, especially in America, nervous breakdowns in the 40s are a very common occurrence. If one examines the victims one finds, then what has broken down is the masculine style of life which held the field up to now, and that what is left over is an effeminate man. Contrarywise, one can observe women in these self-same business spheres who have developed in the second half of life an uncommonly masculine tough-mindedness which can thrust the feelings and the heart aside. Very often these changes are accompanied by all sorts of catastrophes in marriage, for it is not hard to imagine what will happen when the husband discovers his tender feelings, and the wife her sharpness of mind. The worst of it all is that intelligent and cultivated people live their lives without even knowing of the possibility of such transformations. Wholly unprepared, they embark upon the second half of life. Or are there perhaps colleges for 45-year-olds which prepare them for their coming life and its demands as the ordinary colleges introduce our young people to a knowledge of the world? No. Thoroughly unprepared, we take the step into the afternoon of life. Worse still, we take this step with this false assumption that our truths and ideals will serve us hitherto. But we cannot live the afternoon of life according to the program of life's morning. For what was great in the morning will be little at evening, and what in the morning was true will at evening have become a lie. I have given psychological treatment to too many people of advancing years, and have looked too often into the secret chambers of their souls, not to be moved by this fundamental truth. Aging people should know that their lives are not mounting and expanding, but that an inexorable inner process enforces the contraction of life. For a young person, it is almost a sin, or at least a danger, to be too preoccupied with himself. But for the aging person, it is a duty and a necessity to devote serious attention to himself. After having lavished its light upon the world, the sun withdraws its rays 
in order to eliminate itself. Instead of doing likewise, many old people refer to be prefer to be hypochondriacs, niggards, bent pendants, applauders of the past, or else eternal adolescents, all lamentable substitutes for the illumination of the self, but inevitable consequences of the delusion that the second half of life must be governed by the principles of the first. I said just now that we have no schools for 45-year-olds. This is not quite true. Our religions were always such schools in the past, but how many people regard them as such today? How many of us older ones have been brought up in such a school and really prepared for the second half of life, for old age, death, and eternity? A human being would certainly not grow to be 70 or 80 years old if this longevity had no meaning for the species. The afternoon of human life must also have a significance of its own and cannot be merely a pitiful appendage to life's morning. The significance of the morning undoubt undoubtedly lies in the development of the individual, our entrenchment in the outer world, and the propagation of our kind in care of our children. This is obvious purpose of nature. But when this purpose has attained and more than attained, shall the earning of money, the extension of conquests, and the expansion of life go steadily on beyond the bounds of all reason and sense. Whoever carries over into the afternoon the law of the morning or the natural aim must pay for it with damage to his soul, just as surely as growing youth who tries to carry over his childish egoism into adult life must pay for this mistake with social failure. Money-making, social achievement, family, and posterity are nothing but plain nature, not culture. Culture lies outside the purpose of nature. Could be any chance culture be the meaning and purpose of the second half of life? In primitive tribes, we observe that the old peoples are almost always the guardians of the mysteries and the laws, and it is in these that the cultural heritage of the tribe is expressed. How does the matter stand with us? Where is the wisdom of our old people? Where are the precious secrets and their visions? For the most part, our old people try to compete with the young. In the United States, it is almost an ideal for a father to be the brother of his sons, and for the mother to be, if possible, the younger sister of her daughter. I do not know how much of this confusion is a reaction against an earlier exaggeration of the dignity of age, and how much is to be charged to false ideals. These undoubtedly exist, and the goal of those who hold them lies behind and not ahead. Therefore, they are always striving to turn back. We have to grant these people that it is hard to see what other goal the second half of life can offer than the well-known aims of the first. Expansion of life usefulness, efficiency, and the cutting of a figure in society, and the shrewd steering of offspring into suitable marriages and good positions, are not these purposes enough? Unfortunately, not enough meaning and purpose for those who see in the approach of old age a mere diminution of life, and can feel their earlier ideals only as something faded and worn out. Of course, if these persons had filled up the beaker of life earlier and emptied it to the lees, they would feel quite differently about everything now, and they would have kept nothing back. Everything that wanted to catch fire would have been consumed, and the quiet of old age would be very welcome to them. But we, not, we must not forget that only a few, very few people are artists in life that the art of life is the most distinguished and rarest of all the arts, whoever succeeded in draining the whole cup with grace. So for many people, all too much unlived life remains over, sometimes potentialities which they could have never lived with the best of wills, so that they approach the threshold of old age with unsatisfied demands which inevitably turn their glances backward. It is particularly fatal for such people to look back. For them, a prospect and a goal in the future are absolutely necessary. 
This is why all great religions hold out the promise of a life beyond, of a supra-mundane goal, which makes it possible for mortal men to live the second half of life with as much purpose and aim as the first. For the man of today, the expansion of life and its culmination are plausible goals, but the idea of life after death seems to him questionable or beyond belief. Life's cessation, that is, death, can only be accepted as a reasonable goal, either when existence is so rigid that we are only too glad for it to end, or when we are convinced that the sun strives to its setting to illuminate distant races, with the same logical consistency it showed in rising to it the zenith. But to believe has become such a difficult art that it is beyond the capacity of most people, particularly the educated part of humanity. They have become too accustomed to the thought that, with regard to immortality and such questions, there are innumerable contradictory opinions and no convincing proofs. And since science is the catchword that seems to carry the weight of absolute conviction in the contemporary world, we ask for scientific proofs. But educated people who can think know very well that proof of this kind is a philosophical impossibility. We simply cannot add, uh, know anything what, whatsoever about such things. May I remark that for the same reasons we cannot know either whether something does happen to a person after death, no answer of any kind is permissible either for or against. We simply have no definitive scientific knowledge about it one way or the other, and we are therefore in the same position as when we ask whether the planet Mars is inhabited or not. And the inhabitants of Mars, if there are any, are certainly not concerned whether we affirm or deny their existence. They may exist or they may not, and that is how it stands with so-called immortality with which we may shelve the problem. But here my medical conscience awakens and urges me to say a word which has been an, an important bearing on this question. I have observed that a life directed to an aim to an aim is in general better, richer, and healthier than an aimless one, and it is better to go forwards with the stream of time than backwards against it. To the psychotherapist, an old man who cannot bid farewell to life appears as feeble and sickly as a young man who is unable to embrace it. And as a matter of fact, it is in many cases a question of the self-same childish greediness, the same fear, and the same defiance and willfulness, in the one as in the other. As a doctor, I am convinced that it is hygienic, if I may use the word, to discover in death a goal which one can strive, and that streaking away, shrinking away from it is something unhealthy and abnormal, which robs the second half of life for its purpose. I therefore consider that all religions with a supra-mundane goal are eminently reasonable from the point of view of psychic hygiene. When I live in a house which I know will fall about my head within the next two weeks, all my vital functions will be impaired by this thought, and if on the contrary I feel myself to be safe, I can dwell there in a normal and comfortable way. From the standpoint of psychotherapy, it would therefore be desirable to think of death as only a transition, as part of life process whose extent and duration are be beyond our knowledge. In spite of the fact that the majority of people do not know why the body needs salt, everyone demands it nonetheless because of an instinctive need. It is the same with the things of the psyche. By far, the greater portion of mankind have from time immemorial felt the need of believing in a continuance of life. The demands of therapy, therefore, do not lead us into any bypaths, but down the middle of the highway trodden by humanity. For this reason, we are thinking correctly and in harmony with life, even though we do not understand what we think. Do we ever understand what we think? We are only understanding that kind of thinking which is a mere equation from which nothing comes out but what we have put in. 
that is the working of the intellect. But besides that, there is a thinking in primordial images and symbols which are older than the historical man, which are inborn in him from the earliest times, and eternally living, outlasting all generations, can make up the groundwork of the human psyche. It is only possible to live the fullest life when we are in harmony with these symbols. Wisdom is a return to them. It is a question neither of belief nor of knowledge, but of the agreement of our thinking with the primordial images of the unconscious. There are unthinkable ma matrices of all our thoughts, no matter what our conscious mind may cogitate. One of these primordial thoughts is the idea of life after death. Science and these primordial images are incommensurables. They are irrational data, a priori conditions of the imagination, which are simply there, and whose purpose and justification science can only investigate a posteriori, much as it is investigates a function like that of the thyroid gland. Because the 19th century, or before the 19th century, the thyroid was regarded as a meaningless organ merely because it was not understood, it would be equally short-sighted of us today to call the primordial images senseless. For me, these images are something like psychic organs, and I treat them with the very greatest respect. It happens sometimes that I must say to an older patient, your picture of God or your idea of immortality is atrophied. Consequently, your psychic metabolism is out of gear. The ancient Athanasius Pharmacon, the medicine of immortality, is more profound and meaningful than we supposed. In conclusion, I would like to come back for a moment to the comparison with the sun. The 180 degrees of the arc of life are divisible into four parts. The first quarter, lying to the east, is childhood, that state in which we are a problem for others, but are not yet conscious of any problems of our own. Conscious problems fill out the second and third quarters, while in the last, an extreme old age, we descend again into that one condition where, regardless of our state of consciousness, we once become something of a problem for others. Childhood and extreme old age are, of course, utterly different, and yet they have one thing in common, submersion in unconscious psychic happenings. Since the mind of a child grows out of the unconscious, its psychic processes, though not easily accessible, are not as difficult to discern as those of a very old person who is sinking again into the unconscious and who progressively vanishes within it. Childhood and old age are the stages of life without any conscience problems, for which reason I have not taken them into consideration here. That is the end of The Stages of Life by Carl Jung. What follows now is going to be um, just a recap and a series of my own thoughts on this. So what does any of <clears throat> the content in this essay mean? I am no expert. I'm certainly not going to be able to divine reason out of this, but I can just sort of just talk through after reading it for a couple times. You, you've just, you know, presumably listened to me read the entire essay. You know, it's 23 pages long. And Jung describes the stages of life. So he's talking about problems, and he's talking about the different problems that hit uh, a person in their life from cradle to grave is what he says. And he talks about problems, that they're things that are difficult, questionable, or ambiguous. I'm going to cover some ground with this, but I'm going to sort of talk through my interpretation through what I've highlighted throughout the essay we just read together. So we know what problems are and the questions which allow of more than one answer. Um, answers that are always open to doubt. We must even indulge in speculations. Um, he says it right off the beginning that the problems that hit us in life are not the easy ones with solutions. They could have 
um, many different solutions. And that's the whole crux of psychological problems is that they, they don't have easy, easy solutions. Um, he says, psychic life of civilized man is full of problems. Our psychic processes are made up of reflections, doubts, and experiments. Um, and again, I'm quoting a lot here. It is, it is the growth of consciousness, which we much, must thank for the existence of problems. Man turns away from instinct, and that generates consciousness. Consciousness seeks culture or the, den the denial of consciousness. And if we're submerged in nature, we're unconscious. Unconscious. We live in the security of instinct, which knows no problems. He likens, um, these are my words now, he likens animalistic instinct as not being that of humans. So he seems to believe from his writings that animals and humans are very distinct from each other. Animals operate in the realm of nature. They're unconscious. They cannot, um, you know, they can't reason. They can't think through things. And they just are reactive purely based on instinct and that's what separates man um man pulls himself out of nature and by the nature of that you know the they experience lots of problems um and that is the you know the psychic life the psychic problems that afflict us that's what he's interested in that's why he was a psychologist um a psychiatrist okay back to his words we have turned away from certain guidance of instinct and are handed over to fear Problems thus draw us into an orphaned and isolated state where we are abandoned by nature and driven to consciousness. Um, we used to trust ourselves to natural happenings, but now there's a widening of consciousness. So he's really starting from the beginning. I mean, he's trying to say that the stages of life bring about problems in consciousness and you know, he, he takes this very, like, religious. He talks about the biblical fall of man presents the dawn of consciousness as a curse. So he takes it, you know, he's very religious-oriented. Um, I read a little bit um, from this version. There's an introduction in this book. Um, this was edited by Joseph Campbell. I don't know who it was translated by, but it's called The Portable Young. And in the introduction to this book... He describes Young's childhood as being part of a household that, you know, grew up with the religious symbols and, you know, reading about the, the Bhagavad Gita and Hinduism and um, religion and the Bible. So he is divining this from not just a psychological first principle, but from like a religious standpoint. And that's what I really like about reading Young so far. Um Okay, back to his words through this essay. Um, it separates us further from the paradise of unconscious childhood. Um, problems are taboo. He talks about the fact that people don't really talk about their problems <laughs> is part of the problem. Um, when people are psychologically distressed, they don't really bring it up with each other. That's why he has a job, and that's why he's talking through all this in the early 1900s. Um his words, he says, when we must deal with problems, we instinctively resist trying to trying the way that leads through obscurity and darkness. He says, but to penetrate the darkness, we must summon all the powers of enlightenment that consciousness can offer. We must even indulge in speculations. I really liked this part. Um, when, when Jung is talking about the fact that the problems of psychic life, we don't have clear answers for them. We have to speculate. They they are too messy, they're too complicated in order to solve these problems or at least get at something that looks like an answer. We have to get out of the realm of scientific proof and scientific, you know, uh, he, he is not dealing in the, in the realm of mathematics or physics. He is dealing in the realm of uh, psychology and the mind. He goes on to say that man's psyche is a unique combination of factors the special subjects of far-reaching lines of research. Man has produced his sciences. They are symptoms of his psyche. So, you know, that those lines um, in this essay are are clear that he, he thinks that, Jung thinks that all the 
findings of science are downstream from man's psyche, man's consciousness, which makes him psychologically distressed, which causes problems throughout life. The fact that they're um, no longer driven by instincts. We are driven by, you know, consciousness and the ability to divine good from bad and everything, including the scientific methods, are symptoms of that psyche. He goes on to say, how does consciousness arise in the first place? When the child recognizes something, when he knows a person or thing, then we feel that the child has consciousness. So this is a really interesting exercise. Jung goes, you know, the, the, the hard problem of consciousness is obviously it's, it's an issue that's happening right now with like Elon Musk developing AI and Sam Harris talks about this kind of nowadays in 2022 there's lots of podcasts that i've listened to on on this topic of you know what is consciousness and young as you know his due diligence in one of these first essays i'm reading about him he he deals with exactly that problem and the way he comes about it is well let's look at when a child develops consciousness and what he describes in this essay is what we call consciousness is not necessarily when a baby is born. It, they, they just go by instinct. But when the baby gets to be a few months old or a few, definitely a, a year old, and they kind of, there's something behind their eyes where they, you can sort of see that they recognize their mom or dad or, you know, they're happy or sad or, you know, they, they know something. Um, that is the point where we can sort of divine that that person is conscious, is awake. Is, they know what's going on around them. Um, he says that knowing is based, therefore, upon the perceived connection between psychic contents. Really interesting line there. He says the first stage of consciousness, which we can observe, consists in the mere connection between two or more psychic contents. He says, in the childish stage of consciousness, there are as yet no problems. Nothing depends upon the subject, for the child itself is still wholly dependent on his parents. It is as though it were not yet completely born, but were still enclosed in the psychic atmosphere of his parents. Psychic birth, and with it, the conscious differentiation from the pa parents, normally takes place only at puberty, with the eruption of sexuality. Um... I really liked that quote, and the reason I read that off to you guys again, I, I know we've we've covered this, but just kind of taking this, not necessarily line by line, but just going through each of the highlighted portions in the essay we just read, um, I liked this as an explanation because it, it really makes sense to me. It's If you look at the, the journey of the mind, he argues that it seems to him a baby starts to develop consciousness but is still attached to their parents heavily and it's only until that small child sort of um now he he equates it to puberty and the eruption of sexuality i i sort of get what he's where he's going with there um but i think the interest more interesting part here is that you have psychic atmosphere of the parents so you have the mother and father that sort of raise the child and they both have a circle of influence of their psychic components, the things that they worry about, and those kind of overburden the child until the child is old enough to operate on the, their own. And I, I remember that part of, you know, myself, I started to be independent from my parents. You know, yeah, the, the early stages of puberty, um, you know, you spend more time by yourself figuring out life for yourself and definitely rebellious phase against your parents. Um, I think that's very common. He, he mentions that he calls it the unbearable age. And you know, he says, until this period is reached, the psychic life of the individual is governed largely by instinct and few or no problems arise. So it's only until after the child develops their own consciousness that they start to develop their own problems. And then that's compounded in the second and third stages of life, which we'll get into. All right, moving forward. The first stage of consciousness, 
consisting in merely recognizing the knowing or knowing is an anarchic or chaotic state. The second, that of the developed ego complex, is monarchic or monistic. The third brings another step forward in consciousness and consists in an awareness of the divided or dualistic state. Um, I really think that this is intentional the way this is back to my words now so the young says the first stage of consciousness is an anarchic or chaotic state this is very i want to say biblical in nature but it's just it's kind of um you know the most base level of kind of have the the dark unknown what is a person what is where does the mind come from well it comes from uh, like he says a, a dark chaotic state and develops slowly into time. Like, yes, it's into a person, into an individual, but it's not strictly from an unknown place into an individual at the time of birth. It kind of develops months and years into it, and then it goes in from that first stage into a second stage. That That's when the ego complex develops, and it turns into, um, you know, it, it develops into an ego, ego an individual, Um it takes a couple of years, but like, you know, a toddler has some, you know, age by age two of two or three has a sense of I, of me, of a separation between parents. Moving on, uh, Young says, we are all familiar with the sources of the problems that arise in the period of youth. For most people is the demands of life, which harshly put an end to the dream of childhood. Um, this was very interesting because it seems that Almost everybody starts with a childlike wonder, and it's a normal part of maturity that somewhere, or, you know, I don't, I don't know what age he's referring to here, but so somewhere after the period of youth, you ha put an end to the dream of childhood. You start to realize that reality, you can't do everything. And, you know, I'm, I'm 29 as, as the time of reading this, and I've sort of gone through that already and my version of it in my life where I've sort of realized that I can't do everything, but I can do a lot of things. But yet the idea that you can, like you start to realize there's a place in, in like your mid twenties where you sort of realize like, like I, I like to watch sports and the people on there, sometimes I'm older than them, but I'm, I'm like rooting for them. Like you have a 24 year old and I'm 26 watching football. And that's kind of an interesting you know, people in the NBA, etc. Um, okay, let's let's keep going. Uh, Young says it seems as if young people who have a hard struggle for existence are spared inner problems, while those who, for some reason or other, have no difficulty with adaptation run into problems of sex or conflicts arising from a sense of inferiority. This was very interesting because he's kind of young is is looking at the archetypes of the kind of problems that young people have if you have a hard life growing up you don't have a whole lot of psychological inner problems you're not like neurotic and depressed i mean sometimes you are but it's it, you know in american society we have like a mental health crisis going on among like millennials but yet millennials are kind of the best i heard um Oh, who did I who did I hear say this? I heard one of the Republican guys say this. Um, oh, who was it? it? Wasn't Roger Stone? Bannon. It was Steve Bannon. I heard Steve Bannon say one of the problems with millennials is that they're the best, best clothed, most well-fed generation, but they don't own anything, and they have all these mental health problems. Right here, Young is talking about that. Young is saying that people that kind of are raised with no physical difficulties run into problems of sex or conflicts arising from a sense of inferiority. So I thought that was very interesting that Young in fact is talking about this these type of problems back in 1930. Uh, anyway, let's move on. Uh, he goes on to say, psychology teaches us that in a certain sense, there is nothing in the psyche that is old. Nothing can really finally die away. So his 
his analysis of the problems that he sees is that he sees all these problems that afflict his patients from a psychological reason, from a psychological sense, are problems that originated way before the individual. He doesn't think that each individual has a problem. He thinks the psyche is an old thing. Psychology, there's no, there's nothing in it that's new. All of it's old. So that was an interesting insight. Um, he says, achievement, usefulness, and so forth are the ideals that seem to point it the way out of the confusions of the problematical state. Goes on to say, the dilemma is often solved in this way. Whatever is given to us by the past is adapted to the possibilities and demands of the future. We limit ourselves to the attainable, and this means renouncing all our other psychic potentialities. One man loses a valuable piece of his past, another a valuable piece of his future. Everyone can call to mind friends or schoolmates who were promising and idealistic youngsters, but who, when we met them again years later, seem to have grown dry and cramped in a narrow mold. The serious problems in life, however, are never fully solved. I just thought that was so worth repeating that specific line um very interesting i'm going to skip ahead a couple pages and the next highlight i have is this one a man consumes his large supply of masculine substance and has left over only the small amount of feminine substance which must now be put to use conversely the woman allows her hitherto unused supply of masculinity to become active this change is even more noticeable in the psychic realm than in the physical. Really interesting insight there. Um, Jung talks about how, as it certainly seems to be the case, that as men grow older, they become a little bit more feminized later on in life. And he says this, he, he does make the argument that it physically becomes the case that um, men put on a little bit more fat and um, their features grow softer, whereas for women, when they get older, they become a little bit more harsh, a little bit more masculine. Um, after age 40, women tend to take up their outside realm, become matriarchs in their own way. I thought that was an interesting insight. I'm sure that's culturally um, different. I know that Jung practiced in Switzerland and America, um, and he did also interact with Freud. But um, I wonder if that is true over all cultures uh, he goes into it a little bit in the essay but all right let's let's just keep going um another line that i highlighted young says religions were always such schools in the past but how many people regard them as such today um, and this is in reference for the fact that there are no schools for 45 year olds and he says that religion used to be the quote-unquote school and the way we have college is a way for people that are 18 to early 20s to go away and learn on their own and kind of develop what they want to be when they grow up. We don't have the same method for people in their 40s, but I'm kind of reminded of like Zen Buddhism where it's not really meant for people that are young. It's meant for people that are, you know, in the Confucian sense, it's kind of, you know, traditionally meant for men grow up in society give back as a young man you kind of do the warrior path and then in your 30s and 40s you kind of take on a, a leadership role and in your 50s you know maybe that you've you've maxed out you've peaked out at your leadership role and then about your 60s and 70s you go into sort of a monk-like state where you contemplate your role and you get uh respect from you know the fact that you're an elder in the society now and that's sort of traditional confucianism and um Taoism. but we will keep going oh right here so young says i have highlighted in primitive tribes we observe that the old people are almost always the guardians of the mysteries and the laws and it is in these that the cultural heritage of the tribe is expressed. Where is the wisdom of our old people? Where are the precious secrets 
and their visions, for the most part, our old people are trying to compete with the young. In the United States, it is almost an ideal for a father to be the brother of his sons and for the mother to be, if possible, the younger sister of her daughter. Really interesting insight from Young there, where Young is talking about how, especially he seems to be in, ta- referring to the United States, that it's a very young culture um, in that you know, you have the older people in society that are trying to compete with the younger people of society. And this was true in 1930. I'm, it's even more true now where you've got like tech billionaires that try to like wear hoodies and act and look very young, like people in their 20s and 30s. Um, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm not necessarily judging it. I'm just saying that Young did kind of, he's he's calling it out almost 100 years ago, like 90 years ago today. Um and it sort of seems to be the same thing in U.S. culture. But let's let's move on. Young says, A prospect and goal in the future are absolutely necessary. And this is a, a very interesting, this is very Jordan Peterson-esque, where it certainly seems to be that someone in psychological distress is someone without a goal in mind. So if someone is unable to look towards the future and accept it and come up with a plan, and I think we'll get into this later, but sort of uh, go with the flow. So time is moving forward. If someone, if you have someone who's kind of living in the past, they're going to be in psychological distress or someone who's afraid of the future. And it may seem like an obvious insight, but it's true even today. Let's keep going. Um, he says, but to believe that... but." To believe has become such a difficult art today that is beyond the capacity of most people, particularly the educated part of humanity. They've become too accustomed to the thought that with regard to immortality and such questions, there are innumerable contradictory opinions and no convincing proofs. And since science is the catchword that seems to carry the weight of absolute conviction in the contemporary world, world, We ask for scientific proofs, but educated people who can think know very well that proof of this kind is a philosophical impossibility. Man, that is a high impact set of sentences. Um, We are getting towards the end there. I only have, um, let's see, four more highlighted phrases, but just to go over that for a second, he is especially during COVID times, we are looking towards experts and saying from a scientific perspective, what is the proof? What do the experts say? And with such a novel coronavirus, such a novel disease, the experts don't actually know. And to, to push them towards a, um, you know, the, the last line, but educated people who can think know very well that proof of this kind is a philosophical impossibility. He's, he's hitting it, the nail right on the head with that line. Um, I hope that makes sense. I hope that, um, you found that as impactful as I did. So he says, I have observed that a life directed to an aim is in general, better, richer, and healthier than an aimless one. And it is better to go forwards with the stream of time than backwards against it. He goes on to say, As a doctor, I'm convinced that it is hygienic to discover in death a goal towards which one can strive, and that shrinking away from it is something unhealthy and abnormal, which robs the second half of life of its purpose. Wow. Um, That is huge. That insight into the different stages in life. So if you just look at the second half of life, if one person is looking towards death with a negative light, shrinking away from it, that is psychologically damaging. He calls it unhygienic. Very interesting. Um, Young says, there is a thinking in primordial images and symbols which are older than the historical man which are inborn in him from the earliest times and eternally living, outlasting all generations, still made up of the groundwork of the human psyche. 
It is only possible to live the fullest life when we are in harmony with these symbols. Wisdom is a return to them. It is a question that neither of belief nor of knowledge, but of the agreement of our thinking with the primordial images of the unconscious. One of these primordial thoughts is the idea of life after death. That was super interesting when I read that part because, and the reason I highlighted it is because this gets into the real deep part of Carl Jung and it really gives an insight into his psychological theoretical basis. He thinks that man is just a set of ideas and everything that we do throughout our lives is looking towards symbols that are much deeper and more ancient than any of us and anything our minds will be able to comprehend. So he thinks that words and ideas go back much, much, much earlier than, you know, our DNA would suggest. Um, I I hope that makes sense. I, I think that's a really deep idea that things we talk about, things we say to each other, advice that we give trying to be helpful, it comes from a place that is like way beyond, it goes back to my ancestors, goes back to your ancestors. And the fact that we're meeting in the present moment is just like, it's just crazy once you get down to it. Um, just, we're going to see a lot of that in, in future essays, I think, but young with the idea of the symbols and that they're primordial. Um, I really find that fascinating. So, okay, let's, the last two or three quotes here, let's keep going. Young says it would be short sighted of us to call the primordial images senseless for these images are something like psychic organs. I must say to an older patient, your picture of God or your idea of immortality is atrophied. Consequently, your psychic metabolism is out of gear. The ancient Athanasius Pharmacon, the medicine of immortality, is more profound and meaningful than we supposed. So yeah, that's an example of Jung talking to a patient, telling them, you know, your your organ is damaged. Your outlook on life is... Um, unhealthy and it's causing you psychic, you know, uh, troubles. And so I found that super interesting. I I found that extremely interesting because it's, um, I just finished, uh, reading the immortality key or secret secret history of the religion with no name where the author, Brian Marescu, um, goes into the fact that the ancients, you know, he says the key to immortality was psychedelic drug use um, in ancient Greece, the Kukion. And I thought it was interesting that, you know, kind of in a moment of synchronicity that Jung talks about the same concept in this essay, um, the medicine of immortality. And he says the medicine of immortality is kind of your outlook on life. And we all know that psychedelics sort of are meant to, you consume them and use them as a tool to gain new insight and to die before you actually die. So I found that kind of all tied together in a bow with how I've been thinking, and um, it's kind of cool when ideas come together. So it's getting late at night. Um, I hope you enjoyed. This was a little bit of a strange video. I, I will admit that. I'm, I, I, I picked up this book. <laughs> of a collection of essays by Young. I thought it'd be cool to sort of give an introduction, to read through one of the essays, and then to go through it and talk about lines that stood out to me and try to tie them together so that you guys could see how I thought about it. And if you've listened to this far, thank you so much for listening to it. Uh, Please leave your comments below. I will interact back with you guys and enjoy your days. If you're into the same kind of shit that I'm into, this is this is fun. Um, thanks for, for joining me on, on this, uh, kind of little trip into psychology and seeing what the great thinkers of the past have already thought of and seeing if we can make the ideas nowadays tie back to what they were talking about back then and see if we can, um, use it to better our lives moving forward.
So, all right. I look forward to reading more in the future. Thank you guys so much for listening. Bye.